OK, so today we're going to talk about the cryptographic primitives uh, that are used in blockchains. So someone asked whether or not the crypto course was a prerequisite for this course, and it isn't. Uh, we're not going to do a deep dive on the actual implementation of the cryptography uh, that is used to secure blockchains. We're just going to talk about the abstractions that the cryptographic primitives give us that allow us to rely on um, it being secure. Um, so the focus on this, in this class is on all of the cryptographic abstractions we depend upon. Uh, and if you are really interested in how the thing gets implemented underneath, uh, we do have a cryptography class, uh, 485, 585, where you can talk about how do you implement a hash function, how do you implement a public key cryptography, uh, a crypto algorithm. All of those things are done in the crypto class. We're just going to use it. Uh, in this class. Um, so the first thing uh, that we're going to talk about is public key, private key cryptography. Um, and to motivate uh, this kind of cryptography, we first are going to talk about uh, symmetric encryption. So this is the non-public key cryptography. Uh, symmetric, symmetric encryption has three main algorithms. It has a key generation algorithm that generates little k. And then with that little k, you can take a message m with that key k, and you can encrypt it to get some ciphertext c. Uh, and then with that same key, with the ciphertext, you can decrypt it to get the original message back. So this is traditionally how we have uh, gotten obtained secrecy from, from end to end. Um, you use the same key to both encrypt and decrypt. Uh, and here are some examples of these. Uh, they're also called, uh, uh, referred to as block ciphers. So AES, which is one of the crypto schemes underneath for most of your web connections is, uh, is what AES is. And then there's some stream ciphers for uh, large streams of data that are used, that use uh, symmetric key encryption. Uh, the real benefit of symmetric key encryption is that it's really fast. Uh, it's easy to accelerate, and it's good for a large amount of data. Okay? But it's got this fatal flaw. It's got a key distribution problem. Uh, and if anyone captures that key, then they can break the whole thing. Uh, so how do you distribute a key in a symmetric key encryption? Uh, scheme, like how do I securely communicate a key between myself and Google? Um, so we need something else because Google doesn't have, Google's not going to call me and say, this is your secret key, and then allow me to do my search to, on them. So there's another thing that's required in order to distribute this key, uh, and that thing is public key cryptography. Uh, so public key and private key algorithms. Uh, it also has three main algorithms. It has the key generation, it has the encryption, it has the decryption, but it also supports something which is very critical on a blockchain, digital signatures. So we'll talk about these. Uh, so the idea of public key cryptography is that you're using different keys to encrypt and decrypt messages. Uh, and this is also referred to as, as asymmetric cryptography, whereas the other one is symmetric because you have the same key doing encryption and decryption. This is asymmetric because encryption and decryption use different keys. So that's, that's what it refers to when it says asymmetric. Uh, anyone can encrypt a message, and only the owner of the private key can decrypt it. And that's the, that's the abstraction that, that you get. Uh, so examples of this are RSA. So for example, when you're generating your SSH keys, if you've ever generated an SSH key, you're actually generating a pair of a, a, a public key, private key pair, and the public key is the key that you put on like GitHub to establish. Is that what I, yeah, so for the GitLab thing. Uh, that, that's what you're cutting and pasting onto GitLab is your public key. And then hopefully your private key is sitting there nice and secure uh, with, with, with the correct permissions on your local machine and nobody can get to it, okay. Uh, so RSA, ECDSA, they prefer you use the DSA, actually. Uh, RSA is notoriously difficult to, con to, to configure correctly, to get the random numbers done right. So uh, if you have a choice, 
uh, you would want to do uh, DSA, ECDSA. And you'll see that all of the um, blockchain stuff is using ECDSA for signatures. And actually, if you've already done some of the Sawtooth labs, you'll see ECDSA signatures in the code. That's what it's doing. It's trying to, it's given, it's trying to sign date payloads with the private key that, that's, in the, uh, that's in the system. Uh, the problem with public key, private key cryptography is that it's notoriously slow. These are really difficult operations to perform. Uh, it's really hard to accelerate, and it's only good for very tiny amounts uh, of data. Um, uh, but one of the real benefits of this approach is that it's easy to distribute a public key. You just give it away to everybody. You publish it, right? You don't have to like do a secret handshake with, with the person you're trying to communicate with. The person who wants to receive a private message just generates a public key, broadcasts it to everybody, and then anybody who wants to send a private message to this person can just use that public key. And the notion is, is that the private key is the only thing that can decrypt that thing. So in fact, on a blockchain, your wallet address is actually your public key. It's actually a subset of your public key. It's like 40 bytes of it uh, is, is on a blockchain. But we'll get to this, we'll get to this later. Um, and you, with your wallet, will have the private key associated with that public key. Okay, Are there any questions about that? What we're doing with the public key, private key? Okay. So uh, here are some figure definitions that I'll be using in the subsequent slides. Uh, the blue key is your public key. Uh, the red one is the associated private key, uh, and, and this is the thing you keep secret uh, in your, wherever you want to keep your, your secrets. Uh, this little figure is plain text, and then uh, the garbled stuff is ciphertext. So, uh, how do you use asymmetric encryption? Uh, the first thing that happens, so say Bob wants to send Alice a message. Uh, then what you do is you use your, uh, Bob uses the key generation algorithm to generate the keys. And it could be either the RSA algorithm or the elliptic curve DSA algorithm. Uh, uh, Bob will, on his, on his own, generate the two keys. So this is like SSH key gen. Uh, and then what happens is that Bob publishes uh, his public key. So this could be a wallet address or it could be copying that, that public key into to GitLab, that interface. And then uh, once Alice decides that she wants to send a message to Bob, takes this plain text, uh, uses this public key, and encrypts it to generate this garbled junk, which is the ciphertext, okay? Uh, and then sends this over to Bob and uh, the key with this is that the only thing that can decrypt that thing is this thing in red that is kept secret that only Bob knows. So she sends that over to Bob. Uh, anyone who intercepts this can't decrypt it. And then when Bob receives this, uh, he uses the private key to then decrypt to get the plain text. Okay? Uh, we're not doing that in, in the blockchain. <laughs> so, but that's, that's the intent. You do that in other... Uh, in, in other um, uses of public key cryptography that's not blockchain. Say, isn't that pretty similar to PGP? Yeah, so PGP uses that to establish a key. So most crypto systems, so uh, for example, like web, web transactions, you would use a public key operation to validate authenticity and then to bootstrap a, a symmetric key. So when I talked about the Google thing, yeah, they're not going to phone call me and give me a symmetric key. What they're going to do is they're going to publish their public key, and then we are going to, I am going to encrypt a random number that I want to use as part of my symmetric key. I'm going to do that and send it to Google, and then they're going to do something similar on the way back, and then we're going to use that to establish a symmetric key that then uses then that can then, then be used for encryption. So that is the thing that you would cover in, in the cryptography class that we're not going to cover here, just because we don't really, we're not using symmetric key encryption in this class. We're only, we're using like two parts of public key crypto, and those are the two parts that I want to teach, because I'm not really qualified to teach the other parts. So <laughs> just do the two parts that I know pretty well, and then we'll move on, uh, hopefully quickly. Um, 
before a cryptography com cryptographer comes here and tells me I shouldn't be trying to teach this stuff. Okay. Um, so uh, the big thing, so the thing we're going to use, one of the things we're going to use this for is uh, a di digital signature. So the, the key pair, the public key, private key pair, can be used to generate signatures in order to authenticate data. Um, and this is what's done when you go to a website and you download their HTTPS certificate, their, S their TLS certificate. This is what's being done because some authority has signed that certificate so that when you see this certificate, you can validate that it's been blessed by some signing authority. So we talk about this a little bit in the cloud uh, class on digital signatures because that's, that's done on every web transaction. You pull the certificate, you validate that it's true, and then you get the HTTPS golden, the, the, green, the green lock on your browser. Uh, but we're not going to do that. We're going to do something else. Uh, we're going to sign transactions for money. That's basically what we're uh, using the public key uh, crypto for. So say I am Bob, and I have a message that I want to withdraw $1 from the bank of Alice. So here's Alice. She runs a bank. Uh, and I have a, a note, this is my check, say, it's like a digital check, say, hey, you know what, I want to withdraw $1. Uh, and this is a, my, my transaction in plain text. Uh, I am going to, with my private key, uh, sign this payload and then send the payload with my digital signature. So this little thing is my digital signature. Uh, and this digital signature is generated by the red key. And I'm going to attach both of those, uh, the, the payload and the signature, and send that over to Alice. Um, Alice gets this. Uh, she knows my public key because I broadcast it. And the signature verification algorithm takes this with the public key and verifies that, yes, this red key is the only thing that could have produced this signature on that document. to verify only Bob could have sent that. This is non-repudiation. This guarantees that Bob, in fact, generated that signature. There's no, other, there's no other thing that could have generated that except for this private key. And I can tell, I can check this with this blue public key. So on the web, so when we're, we're, I already broke open the HTTPS. So how do we do this for web transactions? It turns out, we have the public key of all the signers for certificates on the internet. It's in our browser. Like, there's like a 200 people that can generate certificates for websites, or that can sign certificates for websites. We have all of their blue keys, so that when we go to Google and say, what's your certificate and who is it signed by? Google will say, here's my certificate. It's signed by Notary X, and we have Notary X's public key in here to say, OK, yeah, Notary X signed you. Okay, so that's a lot to wrap your head around. Are there any questions? Yes. You can go into your browser and set the notaries that you want to say are valid. Uh, Mozilla has been sort of the repository of all blessed notaries. If a notary has been broken into or if a notary has really bad security policies, they will boot them out of the store, the, the notary store, and typically Google Chrome will just follow. It's like, you know what, because Google doesn't want to do this, because then they'll be like, oh, they'll get a lot of political flack as saying, oh, you're trying to control what is secure and what's not secure, so it's much easier for Google to just say, you know what, Mozilla, you figure it out and we'll just copy your stuff. And, and, and that's basically, and you can Google this, and you can, you can actually figure out in your browser, like, and it's, it's scary. Like, I have a picture in the cloud class when we cover this. It's scary how big that list is. That is your train of trust, right? And so that's your supply chain for transactions on the internet. And you're like, I don't want to rely on, I don't want to pick out, like, I don't want to make anything too inflammatory, but I don't want to rely on Notary X, who's been hacked this way and that way for the last year, I want to disable that. And there are a lot of really paranoid people who will go in there and say, you know what, I'm only going to trust these notaries. And then that's it. Uh, 
I just want you to flag anything else as being insecure. And that's fine. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. So once you've done this verification step, like how exactly does that work? Are you just like getting a result that fits a certain format? With yeah. Or? Yeah. You're basically taking this, and there is an algorithm that says whether or not this signature uh, with this public key will actually validate against that. That yeah, against this content. I have a better picture on the. I think it's on the next slide. Um, are there any other questions before I continue? This is like the fundamental thing that I'm trying, one of the two fundamental things that I'm trying to teach you in this, in this class, basically, in this particular lecture. Okay, so once she validates that, yes, this signature is good, she will go ahead and debit Bob's account a dollar and then send him that one dollar. Now, if you think about this, what's happening in a blockchain is that everybody's got Bob's public key, that's his wallet address. Everybody sees this transaction, it's included in a block that we get accepted into a blockchain. Everybody can then say that yes, Bob intends to transfer one dollar from uh, his account from Alice to himself and then they can all update their ledgers. So this is the fundamental process that's going on on a blockchain at least uh, something like Bitcoin. All right. Uh, this is what it looks like um, if you are, well, one of the issues with this digital signatures is that it is really slow to sign something. And so you don't want to be signing like your images or a video or anything like that. It would just take you forever. Uh, so typically what is done is that you take a large document you do a cryptographic hash of that document to bind the integrity of it. So you have a cryptographic checksum. So it makes it uh, sort of, it binds the content to a hash. And then you would sign the hash, right? Because the hash is only like 160 bytes. And it's really hard to change the content and still generate the same hash. So you would sign the hash and then you would sign, you would send the document with the signed hash over uh, to the other side. So here's a picture of a date. You get a, the original data file. It might be big. You throw it through a cryptographic hash function. It gives you a smaller hash. Uh, and then you would use your private key to, to, to sign, to, to produce this digital signature. And you would attach this digital signature along with the original data file and that's what you would send to the other side, okay? And then on the other side, the other side gets this, gets the data file, will send the data file through the hash function, and this is a well-known hash function. The hash function is never secret. It's always well-known. Um, in, in this case, it's always well-known. Uh, and you would use the exact same hash function that you have agreed upon. So Bitcoin has its hash function, Ethereum has, has its hash function, it's agreed upon so that you can then take that file, do the hash, produce this hash value, and then what you would do is you would take this signature and you would use the public key that you have gotten from the sender and you would decrypt the digital signature to produce the, the hash and then you would check, yes, these two things equal each other. So this is typically the way it's done uh, in practice for large documents. You would never use a public key scheme to encrypt a large document. You would just do the hashes. Does this make sense? Are there any questions? OK. So uh, we're going to play along here. Um, there is this uh, URL, and uh, pardon the the crazy URL, I, I'm running this on Google Cloud as a container, and uh, this, this particular container service gives me this crazy URL. So if you can click on this and bring up in two windows the keys uh, path and the signatures path, and uh, in the keys section, you'll set up a private key, public key pair, and then in the signatures, uh, pane, you're going to use the private key to sign a transfer, uh, say, put this in the data field, transfer $20 to me, 
copy the signature. So you're going to use your public key or your private key to sign it, sign this message, and it's going to generate a signature on this page. Copy the signature and then go back into signatures pound verify, paste it, and then click verify. And then modify the message to transfer $200 and then verify it again. And you will see that the algorithm will, will fail. So this is just an example. And underneath, uh, if you actually want to go and look his, at his code, you'll see that it's trying to do the digital signature verification on the content that's being entered into this UI. So if I go here, um, and I'll run it, run it here as well. And signatures. So this is my private key, and this is my public key. Um, so the the private key is over here. So it actually uh, fills in the private key. So I I transfer twenty dollars to instructor. Um, I sign it. This is the message signature. And if I go to verify. Um, the signature, it should say, yes, this is a valid signature, and you can see it's light green. Uh, I can go back and, uh, or I can change this to $200 for the instructor. I can verify it, and of course, that signature doesn't match. When you take this public key and you try and, and validate that the, this signature matches with that message, it says it doesn't match, right? So this is what's happening every time a uh, block is attempting to be accepted into the blockchain, all of the signatures have to be correct in order for you to accept that block. Like you have to prove that the signer of every single transaction actually signed that transaction in the block in order to make sure you have, you ensure that you have authenticity of each transaction, okay? Of both the data and the identity of the, of the, of the sender. Okay, so they actually have a, they have a UI that's similar to this. If you bring up keys and you bring up transactions, uh, you can view the public key again. You can view the private key associated with the from address. So this is me as the from address with my private key saying I want to send a certain amount of money. Uh, you can copy the signature that says I want to send $20. Uh, and then you can uh, paste the signatures to, to in the transactions verify to say that yes, this person signed away twenty dollars, and then uh, modify that to two hundred. Yes. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Let me see here. Let me modify it in place because. Right there. All right, thank you. So yeah, you go back here, you have your keys, you have your transaction, and this is basically the same thing that we just did, but with an actual transaction. So th this would be like a ledger entry uh, on a blockchain, and we'll talk about ledgers in, uh, in a couple classes. But say I want to send $20 from this wallet address to the other wallet address, uh, the sender, address has this public key and has that private key. So, so the, uh, the public key is here, the private key is here, and it's what I have generated here. So I'm saying, I want to sign this because I do want to send $20 uh, from my wallet to the destination. It gives me this message signature. I copy it. I verify. So this should be okay. It's the same thing. I verify it. Yes, that transaction uh, produced, uh, this signature uh, is bound to that particular transaction. And then if I, dis if I change anything about the transaction, it fails my signature test. Okay? So this allows people to really say, it's non-repudiation. When I get your signature, I can say for sure that you intended this transaction. And nobody can tamper with it without breaking that signature. Okay. 
Is that clear? Are there any questions about that? Okay, so the private key is very valuable, as it turns out. Uh, what, uh, so one of the biggest issues is that it has to be generated securely. I mentioned earlier that people are thinking that RSA is hopelessly broken because it's so hard to get RSA to securely generate uh, private keys that are unguessable. So they're seeing that it's being uh, weakened. Uh, so there are implementation issues, but what happens if the people writing the code are malicious? People don't think about that much on the internet. They, they never think that the adversary is the person trying to ship them code. Well, maybe you're, if you're on the Android <laughs> app store, maybe you think that now. But like uh, a lot of times we'll be like, you know that website I just showed you? Maybe that person is giving me malware to get my wallet address. Uh, I have no idea. Um, and then, so as it turns out, uh, this is a, an, an attack vector, right? So uh, this is one of the sneakier thieves, cryptocurrency thieves that I've seen. This particular site was saying, hey, I will generate you your private keys securely. And so what happened was is they were collecting private keys for a while. And then as soon as people started putting their actual ether, real cryptocurrency, into that wallet, they're like, oh, I have this person's private key. And then you just take all of that money out. So you always have to make sure that the, the, the very first step, generating your private keys, has to be done securely. So hopefully when you do an SSH key gen, hopefully the adversary hasn't some, somehow gotten into that program. Like maybe they have, have uh, hijacked uh, apt or De the, the Debian package uh, installer, and then they, they pulled out your, your private keys. Um, but yes, this happens on the, on the blockchain, where you can intentionally, you can either do this explicitly, just pull the private keys. Actually, one of, the, one of my favorite ones is that there is a wallet, so one of the ways you can encode your private key is with a sequence of 20 words. There was a wallet that was leaking the private key by spell checking by sending the words into a spell checker on one of the Google services. <laughs> so making sure that your private key is private, I don't have the link to that, I just, I just read it and I thought it was funny. Uh, it might, I might include it later on. But your private key generation is really important on a blockchain. And yeah, you have to make sure there aren't gremlins in the software that you're using. Um, uh, it has to be kept accessible. Uh, what might happen if you lose your private key? Your, yeah, your money's gone. So this is one of my favorite uh, uh, headlines. It's like, oh, dang, I lost my, yeah, you're basically done. That's it. All of those funds are lost forever. Nobody can get that for you. Uh, that's how secure public key, private key cryptography is intended to be. You lose your private key, it's over. Nobody else can recover that for you. Um, so yeah, uh, they estimate that almost 20% of the total supply of Bitcoin is lost because the private key associated with the public, the wallet address has been lost. And at Portland State, we have lost one Bitcoin out of this. So out of those 21 million Bitcoins, we lost one here. We mined one in 2010, and then like that machine got wiped out. So there, there's $7,000 of, well, I don't know, what is the Bitcoin? Anyone follow this? What's the Bitcoin price today? $7,000? That was $7,000 a pizza we could have bought for the, uh, for the department. Um, um, so yeah, so you'll see stuff like this happening. This is a couple years ago. He had his, uh, uh, his secret key, his private key, or the, the password to unlock it, uh, and then threw it away in the trash, 108 million. So uh, this is why people take their private key, store it in a, in a bank vault. That's called a cold wallet. You're like, okay, the bank owes me $108 million if they lose that sheet of paper, uh, but I'll stick it in there so I don't throw it away. So that's the idea. Uh, 
it has to be kept secret. You cannot let anyone get your private key. Uh, what happens if you get your stolen? Yeah, but I've never in the history of, well, actually, <laughs> one time it was returned to the, it was, uh, money was, I'll have to look up that article. But pretty much, everyone out there, when they get your private key, is going to take your money, not give you anything back. Uh, so this is what happened to Binance in May. Binance is one of these, the largest exchanges for, for cryptocurrencies. They lost 7,000 Bitcoin, which is like $40 million, uh, because someone got in, infiltrated their uh, uh, systems. So they are a big red target for hackers, right? If you can get on the inside of their computing systems, you have the ability to go after their, their wallet keys. And foolishly, they had a whole bunch of their assets in a single wallet. And they went after that, and they got 7,000 Bitcoin. And I just read an article last week is that Binance is looking like they're going to have to fold. Uh, and I would imagine this didn't help uh, in May. Um, and you can actually see the transaction that siphoned out all of their money. So this is the, the transaction on the blockchain. And you can see this is a huge list, and it adds up to 7,000 Bitcoin. So that is basically a $40 million transfer from Binance to an adversary in a single block. Uh, and so it almost makes you want to say, hey, let's uh, undo this transaction. We'll get to that later because there's been a lot, of, there's been some undos that have happened on the blockchain, but this would be one of those things where um, should we make it immutable? Should we make a blockchain really immutable? Do we really mean it? Um, it turns out for this one, yes, it's immutable, it's gone. Okay, uh, but this leads to things like multi-signature schemes. So if I don't want a single point of failure, that one private key is going to ruin me, then I would be, like, I'm a fault-tolerant guy, I'd like try and do multiple signatures, and you would need a subset of those signatures to do a transaction. So this has the benefit that if I lose one private key, I still have the rest of the keys that can be used to transfer uh, the funds maybe to a different multi-signature account, right? So I, could, I can recover from one key loss. So a lot of the sort of the higher end systems are using these multi-signature wallets. Uh, but you better hope that that multi-signature software actually works. And we'll see that sometimes it doesn't. And then you still lose all your money, which is another, we'll get to that in like four or five weeks, where you can still lose your money on a multi-signature wallet, but the idea is that one lost key won't compromise everything, okay? Uh, so if you lose it, your funds aren't completely lost. If an adversary gets it, then the adversary still needs the other keys to agree to that transaction. So this is a better way of managing cryptocurrency and it's typically the way that is done if you have a large cryptocurrency operation, multi-signatures. So some examples of this is Bitcoin's uh, pay-to-script hash, where you can send the Bitcoin scripting language some logic that says that only, only um, uh, send this transaction through if you have the proper number of signatures uh, to sign that transaction. Okay. Uh, this can also be done using a smart contract, but I haven't talked about what a smart contract is. is uh, but it's, um, it can be done two ways, natively with the cryptography or with smart contract code. Um, natively with cryptography uh, gets you some of these schemes. So threshold ECDSA and threshold ED25519. These are ways of establishing multiple private keys that can be distributed to multiple entities, and then you would have a subset of them uh, be able to generate, so in this case two out of the three, can then generate a, signal, a, a signature that can then transact the, the uh, whatever, whatever money transfer that you want. Uh, so in both cases, uh, this is picturing two out of the three keys are needed to actually do something on a blockchain. So, Decide to put that in there. Are there any questions about 
private key, public key, and digital signatures. Okay. So the other part of the cryptography that we're going to use are cryptographic hash functions. And this will give you the immutability and the tamper resistance of a blockchain. Um, so cryptographic hash functions are these one-way functions that take an arbitrarily sized amount of data and then puts, uh, generates a random looking fixed length output where the length of that output is much smaller than the data that you have sent through uh, that, that function. Uh, on a blockchain, it's typically not a huge amount of things that you're, you're hashing, but that's the idea. It, and traditionally, that's what a cryptographic hash function will do. Um, so in this class, or in this uh, set of slides, we're going to have this hash function, capital H, and we're going to have an input, X, uh, and we're going to have a hash function output, that's little h, that gets generated. I hope I have kept this notation all throughout. Um, uh, typically, hash functions are constructed in this manner. Uh, there's this compression function uh, that has been uh, designed by Merkle Damgard. It maps m bits of input, which are at the top. Uh, to, uh, it takes uh, little n bits of input. It takes little m bits of input. And then from these two things, it will compress the m bits into another n bit output. So you're taking some initial vector, you're taking n bits of input, and you're generating another n bits of output. Um, and this is what the, is believed to be a secure construction for hash functions that will meet the, the properties that I'll talk about later. Uh, the way you then use this construction in a hash function is that you have this input that you want to produce a hash for. You take an initialization vector, so this is your initial n bits. Uh, and then you take the first m bits of the input, so this is length little m, and you take that first block of m bits and you send it through this compression function with this little n as an initialization vector, and it produces n bits of output that are then used as input to the next stage of the compression function. And in the next stage, you take the second block of m bits, through this compression function with this, uh, the previous stages n, and then you generate the next stage. So this sort of avalanches from the first block to the second to the third, and it, and, and it goes through, and at the end, you produce a single hash uh, as an output that is really bound to the content that was sent through this construction. So there's a lot of theory behind how this works that we're going to skip. Uh, but the, the abstraction that you get from this construction uh, are these desired properties. Uh, the first is that you want to be able to ensure that that process gives you a deterministic result. And sure enough, with a particular initialization vector, it gives you the same result for the same data over and over again. A hash function is useless if it gives you random results from, from one end to the other. So everybody can generate the same deterministic output given the same input. Uh, the other one is that it's efficient. It's quickly computed. And it turns out those compression functions can be made very fast. The, the, bit, the bit permutations and the bit twiddling and all that other stuff in that, uh, that compression function can be made fast. Uh, the, the next property is called pre-image resistance. And I've... Uh, I've highlighted the ones in red that we care about, but the ones that you want a regular hash function to have are, are these. Uh, so the, the next one is pre-image resistance. Uh, it is infeasible to go, from the, uh, to, to go from the output. So if you have some hash, it's impossible if all you're given is the hash to, to know anything about the input that generated that hash. The hash itself gives no hit clue as to the kind of content that was passed to the hash function to produce it. So that's pre-image resistance. We don't care about that. Uh, we care about the other one, the second pre-image resistance. And this is the basis 
for immutability on a blockchain. This is how we can be sure that nobody can forge a block. So the second pre-image resistance property is that for a given input, so I know the input x1, and I know that it produces a particular hash. So with that, I know, I know x1, and I know the hash of x1. It, is, it should be difficult to find another input x2 that produces the exact same hash. Because if it were easy, then I could say, no, you didn't mean transfer $20. You meant transfer 2,135,623 Bitcoin to me. So that is second pre-image resistance. You know a transaction's hash, for example, and you want to produce another transaction that can give you the same hash. But if that is super hard to do, then you can say, like, okay, nobody can forge that, right? Nobody is able to produce a hash that's got bogus data that's got this, that matches the same thing as a previously known uh, block. Okay, does that make sense? The property, at least? That's the abstraction. I'm not going to talk about how do, you, how do you prove that. How do you prove that is in the cryptography class. Okay. Uh, another one is collision resistance. So it's, it, this is a weaker property than the other one, uh, the, the, or it's an easier one to find. Uh, collision resistance says that it's hard to find any pair of inputs, x1 and x2, such that they have identical hashes. It's different. So the second pre-image is that you're given a hash. Uh, this one says, try and find any two inputs that will produce the same hash. If you look at a hash function, it's taking a huge amount of data and then giving you a small amount of output. So you will get collisions, right? Like if there are 160 bytes to your hash, well then two to the well, eight times 160 is the number of unique hashes that are there. You can have way more documents than the number of hashes. So you will find multiple documents that give you the same hash. It should be nearly impossible to do so. Like the heat death of the universe should happen before someone finds that is the idea of this property. Uh, so this property is not very useful uh, to us because typically we are given hashes that you would want to try and subvert. <laughs> like this, this is unusable uh, to attack a blockchain um, the way we use it. Uh, the last property that we're going to use that is relevant to the blockchain is this avalanche effect. Uh, and this is the basis for the proof of work algorithm for uh, Bitcoin miners uh, effectively. So the miners uh, are are being driven by the fact that this hash function has this prop particular property. Uh, and this property is that when you change a single bit to the input x, it will cause every output bit in the resultant hash to flip with probability half. So this basically says if you twiddle the input in any way, small way, you'll get a completely random output as a result you won't be able to predict which bits will flip on the other side. Um, so this is effectively saying that, hey, there's a way I can make this hash function a random number generator, a secure random number generator, right? Like I can't game the, the input to be able to produce a specific output hash. And we'll see that this is the algorithm that, this is the property that the miners are, 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 are being ruled by is the avalanche effect. As soon as you have this being removed from a hash function, then the miner that can figure out this will get a lot of money. So if you're into math and you don't believe that your hash function or the two hash functions that are being used are secure, then you could probably attack the math and try and get, get cryptocurrency that way. Okay, are there any questions about this? We'll, we'll go a little bit deeper later, yep. You will be, if, if, especially if the hash function is weak. So they, uh, if, you go, if you go and look up uh, the history of MD5, the MD5 hash function, uh, they thought it was weak, 
And then somebody produced a document, a Word document, that also had a PDF attached to it. And they were able to produce the exact same hash for both payloads because they understood how to send data through the compression function so that you could target a particular hash. So this is that second pre-image resistance. I have a document, a Word document, and it's blessed. Somebody signed it with MD5, says this is the checksum for this document, and somebody took that document, added a whole bunch of stuff to make a, a PDF document, and then produced the exact same hash. That is second pre-image resistance. And then when they sent this document over, if you parsed it as a PDF, you would get the malicious document that says transfer 5,000 Bitcoin to this bank account in Asia. And it's like, oh, look, it's, it's uh, signed by the CEO. I'll, I should do that. I forget what the document actually was. I'll, I'll, I'll try and dig up a link and forward it to the Slack channel where MD5 was, the second pre-image resistance of MD5 was broken. And this is why they're telling people, don't use MD5. So fortunately, the Bitcoin uh, folks decided not to use MD5. <laughs> uh, but they're using other hash functions, and eventually those hash functions, some smart person is going to break those, and then we'll have to go do something else. Yeah. Uh, SHA-1 is, actually, I have that. I think I have this in the next slide. Okay, so let me go to specific ones. SHA-1 is pretty weak now. Um, so uh, the example of a hash function that we're going to talk about is SHA-2. Uh, this is designed by the NSA, published in 2001, has a digest size that can accommodate 224 up to 512 bits. So that's your N, right? When you produce the hash, you can either produce a hash that's 224 bits, and then these increments up to 512. Um, and this is the one that's used in Bitcoin. So they do a double SHA hash, and that is what they use as a transaction hash for a block. And this is what they're using for mining uh, hashes, which we'll talk about uh, in a bit. So they use uh, double, well, it's sometimes referred to as uh, OK, so we left off on SHA-2. And this is the hash function that's used in Bitcoin. Um, so, but you can see SHA-2 is quite old, uh, 18 years old, uh, but it's still, still going. People are, uh, there are no known uh, attacks on SHA-2, so, um, but all of the earlier predecessors are now considered broken. So MD-5 in particular from 1992, so this is the Merkle Damgar MD, so that's one of my previous things. There are some issues in the way this particular thing used that construction. So that's been compromised. People figured out some vulnerabilities in the way it was constructed, and the collision resistance was, has been broken since 2004. And the second pre-image resistance was broken in 2010, and that was this paper I just was trying to mention. I found the link, and I posted it on the channel. This is a postscript file that uh, has two things that will allow it to hash to the same uh, yeah, so this is the link uh, in the web archive. Um, wait, that's not it. This is the link, sorry, <laughs> in the web archive. So this is the paper on the poisoned message attack, the story of Alice and her boss. This is if you're interested in this kind of, kind of stuff, um, where they have two files, a letter and an order that they combine that can, that can be used to produce the same MD5 hash, and they're able to use those as uh, maliciously so that you can see one and think that it's the other, which is, that's, that's the devastating attack. Uh, so it's a similar idea for a transaction. You see one hash, and it was produced with one input, but it's actually another. And that, that's, that's second preemptive resistance. And that's, that's where, the, where you would make money if you broke that for SHA-256. Uh, So that's why none of these things are being used. Uh, I actually don't know the status of uh, uh, the other two. I just know that they're weak. Uh, so collision, 
collisions have been found in SHA-1, uh, but I don't know if they've gotten any further. So this is from 2017. They're just telling you never use SHA-1. Well, you should definitely not use MD5, but MD5 is still everywhere. <laughs> like, people are using it to hash passwords, uh, MD5 still. Uh, so you shouldn't be using that. And uh, if you don't have MD5, but you have SHA-1 or SHA, you shouldn't be using that either. But there's a lot of legacy stuff that does use it. Uh, so uh, then the question is, is when might SHA-2 be broken, if ever? And in fact, uh, when Google gets their quantum computer up and running, is that susceptible to being broken? And if you put all your money in the blockchain that's secured by hash functions like these, then you have a problem. Uh, I don't think, there are no known attacks of quantum, there are no quantum algorithms that attack hash functions that I know of. Uh, but this was something, uh, we had a quantum cr cryptographer here a couple years ago. This is something that they were looking at uh, to see whether or not you can attack the underpinnings. You could definitely attack RSA if you're using that as a signature algorithm, which is why I think a lot of the blockchains are using something else. They're using DSA, uh, elliptic curve, which I don't think there is a quantum exploit for. Yes. Okay, so as long as, long as that number's big, <laughs> I, you know, that actually might, I mean, the fact that you'd have to break it twice here might help uh, for Bitcoin at least. Um, okay, so uh, another example of a hash function is this Kekak algorithm. This is the winner of the SHA-3 competition sponsored by NIST to replace both SHA-1 and SHA-2. Uh, there was a contest. And actually, we had a cryptographer here who submitted something into this contest. There was like 53 or so uh, crypt, uh, hash function uh, candidates. And they threw them all up there. They all got attacked uh, by each other, actually, because as a crypto cryptographer researcher, you want your algorithm to be blessed and uh, enshrined in, in history. So when all of these algorithms went up, they all got attacked. And then the last one standing, was uh, these folks from, I think they're from Germany. Uh, so that's, I don't even know what the name refers to, but uh, it ended in 2012, and, and this is the algorithm that they're now using uh, for SHA-3. Um, the, it has this, the innovation is this thing called a sponge function that generates hashes of an arbitrary length. And so these are the hashes that you can configure the length to for SHA-3. And this is what Ethereum is using in their hashes. So uh, yeah, so the Kekak algorithm is actually built into uh, uh, the, the SDK. Okay, so there are, I referred to those two properties that we rely upon hash functions holding in order to be used for the blockchain. We're gonna talk about those two. Uh, the first one is to ensure the lasting integrity of a block. So the hash signature is going to completely change if you twiddle any bits in that block. Uh, moreover, the second pre-image resistance makes it difficult for anybody else to find a second block that will hash to the same value. As soon as they do, you've lost the integrity, right? Because then you don't know which of the two uh, that hash belongs to. So this is what we rely upon to make sure that those blocks are unique and haven't been tampered with. Okay, uh, so a demo of this, if you go to this, this uh, site uh, and you twiddle around with the parameters, um, you can see if you look at the hash function at the bottom, if you type anything into it, you'll see that all the bits will flip randomly, right? This is what a hash function should do. If you add the same character, it's still going to give you random hashes back. Like you won't be able to predict which bits flip. If you are able to predict it, then you have an attack that you can explore. And this is where they started attacking MD5. They started looking at the structure of the output based on the kinds of input they were sending in, and they saw some pattern 
And this is where you can then go into the internals of that algorithm and start breaking it. So if you can find a pattern, uh, find an advisor to do some crypto research and try and break this thing, because that, uh, that would get you a lot of notoriety. Uh, OK, the second use for a, a hash is mining blocks. Um, so what does this mean? Uh, the reason why we mine blocks on a blockchain is to slow down the rate at which the blockchain is updated. So we want to avoid what's known as the double spend problem, where I spend a particular um, dollar or Bitcoin twice. Now, if I send two transactions simultaneously, I have one Bitcoin, and I send two transactions almost simultaneously saying, I'm going to spend both of these things. I want only one of them to be accepted and then the other one to be rejected because they can see that the transfer has happened in the previous block. So in order to guarantee this, they have to make sure that blocks are only added once every 10 minutes in Bitcoin. So I have committed to the previous state of the ledger before I then consider the next block on the ledger. And then I can verify that, yeah, you really do have that one Bitcoin to spend. So this is where mining comes in. How do I slow down the blocks being added? Uh, moreover, I also want to limit the supply of cryptocurrency available. And so if I uh, slow down the number of blocks added, and each block that's added rewards cryptocurrency, then at the same time as slowing down the transaction blocks, I can slow down the rate at which I mint new cryptocurrency. So in the end, a miner is not going to mine a block unless it can get some cryptocurrency out of it. So there is a block reward for a successfully mined block in Bitcoin. And so that needs to be slowed down too because you want to restrict the supply of currency. You want that to be predictable versus a fiat currency where they can just keep on printing money. So this is the reason why there is a mining operation on a blockchain for a public uh, blockchain where you're trying to have all these participants participate in a distributed manner while slowing down both the minting of money and the rate at which blocks are added to the blockchain. So it, it kills two birds with this one stone. Are there any questions about what we're going to do here? Or the, the goal of it, at least, because that's, that's pretty important up front. OK, so in order for you to accept the block, the block has to have all the transactions be valid. Moreover, it must come with a random with an integer, which uh, is called a nonce, it must come with a nonce when combined with a block produces a hash, one of those hash functions is applied to this, produces a hash with a certain number of leading zeros in the hash, right? Like you saw the random hashes changing. Well, you need to provide a nonce when combined with your data that gives you a bunch of leading zeros. And then, will say that, yes, you have successfully mined the block. We're going to commit that particular block to the blockchain, and you're going to get some money. That's the, that's the idea. So in this, the hash function is, is treated as a random function, right? Like, you're randomly uh, generating these bits based on a nonce that you're giving. And if you got lucky, and you got a whole bunch of zeros in front of it randomly, then that is basically your reward, uh, the, the miner that gets reward. So it's, it's, all the miners are performing a brute force search by incrementing this nonce and checking the hash. Incrementing it again, checking the hash. So that's everything that they do. Uh, and because of this property that the bits in the hash flip uh, with probability 50% for anything that you change, including the nonce, that will eventually limit the rate at which you can find valid blocks. And the number of leading zeros, this is configured. Somebody, the miner, configures this based on how easy it was to mine the previous block. They're like, whoa, that previous block got mined in two seconds? Or not two seconds, 30 seconds? Someone got really lucky, or either someone got really lucky, or someone bought an enormous computer, and now they found that block in like 30 seconds, and I was expecting it to be 10 minutes. I better crank up the number of leading zeros to slow that thing down. And so this is what the this this is what this function is being used for. Okay, so the demo. 
uh, ma manually find a nonce that produces a hash with one leading zero given data mind me. So go visit that link. Uh, uh, change the nonce without clicking, uh, there's a typo there, without clicking on the mine button, because the mine button does something else, but just uh, keep uh, incrementing the nonce in the one form element and then see which nonce, find the lowest nonce that will give you uh, a zero. Um, so why don't I have you do that? Um, while I do that here. I think this is block. So mind me. One, two. So did you get 13? So 13 is the smallest number that produces a zero. I hope you can see that. Produces a zero in that hash. OK? So this is the operation. And that was an easy one to find. Um, so oh, man, how did that happen? So now I have some questions. Um, so the smallest nonce was, uh, was 13. That gives us a zero. Uh, the first question, how many hashes on average would it take to find a nonce that has two leading zeros? Use your knowledge. So those are hex, those are hex digits in that hash. So each hex digit is four bits. This is why it took around 16 it, on average, it should take eight to get that first digit to be zero, because if it truly is a random function, then the probability that a nonce will give you a, a zero is one in 16, right? And so what would be the probability, how many nonces would it take to get one with two leading zeros on average? Close. 128. So two leading zeros represents eight bits. Uh, eight bits is 256 values. So you have a one in 256 chance of producing a hash with two leading zeros. But on average, you'll get it at 128. So um, let me see here. You, I could have you do that, but but you get the idea. You can manually, so you could repeat what we just did to try and find two leading zeros, and then hopefully by 128, you found one with two zeros. But I don't, I don't want, yeah, that's, but you understand the mining operation uh, that's going on. That's basically going through all of those entries. What about four leading zeros? How many, um, uh, how many uh, hashes on average would it take you to find that hash with four leading zeros? How many bits is four leading zeros? Yeah, so it's 16 bits, 2 to the 16th, or 4 to the, wait, 16 to the 4th, yes. So this is, uh, what's that number? It's 65,500 and 16 bits. Yeah, 65, 536. So on average, you need around 32,000, right? So this is what that mine button does on that UI. So once you go back to that UI and click the mine button and see that the nonce that you get uh, is around that. So that's what we're going to do. OK, so we'll go back here. Um, and then we'll click mine. And this mine button is going to try and get a hash with four leading zeros, and it's going to update the nonce to the nonce that actually satisfies that. So here it's about 48,000. So we, we said it was around 32,000 to get one. So it's, it's calculated 48,000 hashes before it actually successfully mined a block. And if I uh, you know, give it a different input and I say mine this, it's going to give me a different nonce, and it's going to you know, 
hopefully be around. Sometimes it, it goes way beyond 65,000. It's all random, but it's on average is what we're talking about. So this nonce is going to be huge. What is block number? Uh, um, it's just this is the origin block, but it's a, so the block number is also hashed as part of this, but it's yeah, it's not germane to what we're talking about because we don't have a chain yet. Uh, so the, there, I mean, it took 204, um, but it is a random function, right? You can't predict the nonce that you're, that's going to satisfy that. If you could predict it, then you have an ability to, to break, the, uh, break the algorithm. Okay, so this has to be completely random. Okay, um, I could have you do this, but I won't. Um, you, uh, this is an interesting, actually, if someone does this and posts it on the channel, I'll give you a YubiKey as a prize. Uh, I was going to run it in class, but I, you know, I don't think I have time. Yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to run it in class, but go here, set the block number to today's date, uh, set the data to blockchain without the quotes, repeatedly change the nonce and hit mine to try and find a nonce that results in a hash which starts with five zeros. So if you, if you hit mine and it gives you something with four zeros that doesn't have the fifth one, then leave the nonce the way it is, or increment the nonce by one and hit mine again. It should incrementally go from there uh, to get you one. Um, so for example, with this nonce, you can get that, uh, oh geez, I hope that's not actually the answer. Ignore, like, <laughs> if someone is doing this right now, you can claim the YubiKey prize. Take a screenshot, post it on the channel, and I'll get you a YubiKey uh, uh, next week, or actually at the end of class if you, if you do it in time. So that's, uh, that's a little fun activity that I am going to skip, unfortunately. Um, okay, so the other exercise I want you to do is, so what is Bitcoin's um, um, current work function? So I want everybody to go to that site, blockchain.com explorer. This is a website that gives you a UI on all of the blocks currently in the Bitcoin blockchain. I want you to click on the latest transactions and see how many leading zeros are required for a successfully mined uh, block. Um, and so this is the number of zeros that are required to hit a, an approximately 10 minute block time with the current hardware. And it turns out all, most of the current hardware is, is hosted in China. So this thing is targeting the mining pools in China to slow them down so that they're only producing a block every 10 minutes. So yeah, why don't we, has someone done that? Well, 18 zeros. Yeah, so that would take a lot for our little JavaScript app, which is basically what this thing is doing. It's mining it in JavaScript. So yeah, it would take a lot for you to, uh, to get a hash that would produce this number of leading zeros, if you see this, I'll blow it. Yeah, that is a lot of leading zeros. And that is how we make sure that a block is only added 10 minutes, or how Bitcoin uh, makes sure of that. I don't know why it showed you what I was reading. We'll get to Fairwin later, which is what this thing is showing on the screen. Where is it getting that? Oh, good. All right. That's a fascinating, fascinating article. They, uh, there's this uh, Ponzi scheme, this Ethereum Ponzi scheme that had some uh, vulnerabilities in it, and somebody posted that they had found some critical vulnerabilities in it, and then the next day it had gotten emptied out. They're not quite sure who emptied it out, uh, but uh, the researcher is going to post a post-mortem on his analysis, and hopefully that's done in time and published that I can actually include it in the, uh, in the second half of the course when we talk about security problems and smart contracts, but uh, that's, that's, what it, that's why you see me reading that stuff. Um, but cross my fingers. Um, Okay, um, so we've talked about blocks. What is exactly stored in a block? Well, 
for Bitcoin, it's currency transactions. Uh, so transfers from one wallet to another wallet, uh, and it's basically a shared ledger. Uh, a block could also contain program execution state. So in Ethereum, it's basically the state of the virtual machine that can be in the block, or tra state transitions in the virtual machine that could be a block. Uh, so this is where smart contracts uh, uh, operate, uh, where you can store the state of a particular code execution into the blockchain. So that's another thing. Um, another one is asset ownership. So we, all, we talked about this in the last class, like deed assignment, for example. You could be doing that on uh, transactions on a block. So basically a non-currency way of doing a ledger. Um, the data itself. So if you want the, so for that Steemit application, if you want to make sure that that data can't be censored, you would just push it up onto the blockchain, the, the entire data. Um, but if you're putting the data up there, this is super expensive. So when you build your smart contract and you start storing a bunch of state in your contract, you'll see that the amount of cryptocurrency that you need to support your smart contract just starts going way up. And so you would typically not want to store the entire data on a blockchain. If you're using a blockchain for a, a timestamp, then you would take that cryptographic hash you take that document, take a cryptographic hash, and then you put that on the blockchain. It's much smaller. So that's basically what some of these companies are doing. They're taking the hashes, they're committing the document hash to the blockchain, and then later on, if a regulatory agency or if some intellectual property claim is made, you can say, here's the hash, committed to the blockchain, here's my document, matches the hash, I, I own this document at that point in time, and that's, a, that's uh, one of the ways that that a blockchain is being used. Okay, uh, yeah, there's a YouTube there if you're interested in, that, in, in what Stamp, this is the Stamp.io uh, site is what they're doing. Okay, but uh, one of the issues we have is that we wanna validate a single transaction in a block, but we have to go through the entire block to generate that hash. And this takes a lot of sort of overhead. This is a lot of overhead. I have to touch a bunch of data and you saw in that Merkle Damgard construction, I'm going through all of the data to validate one hash. Uh, this is inefficient. Moreover, if I want to validate the state of the blockchain from the very beginning to the very end, I'm going through the entire blockchain's worth of data. And on, on Bitcoin, this is 200 gigabytes of data. Like, I don't want to do that, like every time I want to validate something. And so this motivates different techniques to improve the performance of a blockchain. Uh, the first one is this thing called the Merkle tree. So I have a block, and the transactions in this block go from A to P, and each one of these transactions has a, a single hash associated with it, so I can validate the block. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna organize it in a tree, and I'm gonna take pairs and generate another hash, and then from those pairs, I'll take pairs of those, generate another hash, and when I have a transaction that I wanna verify belongs to this block, what I'll do is in the bottom right, say I want to validate that this uh, transaction K is actually legitimate. I will take uh, the hash of that. I will, I will pull the hash of, H of, of transaction L to generate H of KL. I'll hash that with the block's value of H of IJ and go up the tree so that in order for me to validate that this block belongs in this, uh, uh, or this transaction belongs in this block, I only have to touch these hashes in the Merkle tree. This allows me to efficiently validate it, validate that transaction without going through all of the data. All of the stuff in white doesn't get touched for me to validate that. So that is what a Merkle tree is used for in a block. And this is done within a block. Okay, are there any questions about that? Because the next thing I wanna do is chain these things together. And the reason why I want to chain these things together is to get immutability across the blocks. And so uh, this is very similar to the way the Merkle Damgard construction is, except rather than being done within a block or within a transaction, I'm doing this between blocks of the blockchain. And this is where blockchain gets its name. I'm going to take one block and its hash is going to be the input, this previous hash thing, is gonna be the input to the next block 
as part of the next block. And so the, the previous hash plus the current block's transactions have to be hashed and have to have the mining uh, function uh, met in order for me to include this in the next chain, in the, as the next block in the chain. And what this allows me to do is it makes sure that someone can't change a transaction here without forcing them to change all the transactions subsequently. And this gives you the immutability because this is that second pre-image resistance uh, issue. I, can't, I don't want to be able to forge a block here that matches the hash that gets sent in a subsequent chain. Otherwise, I can go to transaction one on the, on the Bitcoin blockchain and assign all of those Bitcoin to myself uh, rather than, I forgot who received it uh, initially, but, but basically you don't want to be able to selectively go to a single block, generate a hash that gets you uh, the next hash in the block and then change history. So in order for you to change history, you have to uh, change this block and then mine all the subsequent blocks in order to, to change the chain. Okay, so put together, this is what a traditional blockchain looks like. Uh, you have blocks going from left to right that are in a chain where the previous hash is being used in the current block to generate the next hash. And then within each block, you have this Merkle tree that allows you to efficiently validate all of these individual hashes. Um, so this is where, this is where blockchain gets, gets its name. Okay, and then to, uh, I think this is the last thing. Oh no, this is not the last thing. Um, hmm, I ran out of time. I might just finish this. I will finish this uh, next Monday. Uh, didn't think it would take me this long, okay. But yeah, I'll finish this on Monday since we're, we're out of time. It's actually, actually, I can run. Okay, so the, the demo of this, if you click on uh, blockchain blockchain, uh, you can see that in this UI, the previous hash is included in the current block so that it, it forms the next block's uh, state. And then if you uh, tamper with one of the blocks, it invalidates all of the subsequent blocks because the hashes no longer match. And so uh, what I want you to do is to tamper with like the middle block. When you go to this UI, you'll see the hash chain, tamper with the middle one, and you'll see that it invalidates the subsequent ones. And then into, in order to then get a completely valid blockchain after that, you have to mine all the subsequent blocks. So that is what, that is what an adversary would need to do if it tries to tamper with some state in the blockchain that has uh, been committed earlier. And so uh, you will see that older blocks are much harder to attack because then the adversary has to regenerate a whole bunch more hashes than one that has just been submitted onto the blockchain, in which case you only have a couple blocks that have to be remined. And so that's what this demo is meant to show you. So if you click on this link, I'm having some issues here. <laughs> um, chain. So if you look at this, there's five blocks here. One, two, three, four, five. They form a chain. If you look, the previous hash is taken from the, 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 uh, the hash that precedes it. The initial uh, previous hash is zero, so this is the origin uh, block, so it doesn't have a previous hash. Uh, if you go and you change the transactions here, say uh, transfer, you invalidate the, uh, the middle block and then you're also invalidating all the subsequent ones. And so in order for you to then patch up this hash chain, uh, this blockchain, you're going to have to mine this one, produce the hash that's legitimate, and then it fills in the previous hash here, but now you don't have a hash that matches, so you have to actually generate uh, the next hash. And then that changes the previous hash again, and then you have to mine it again. So that is, uh, that is the protection that you're getting from chaining the blocks from one end to the other. Um, and then, oh, maybe I can rush through. Um, all right. 
actually, thanks for that. I'm going to actually f try and finish. <laughs> if I have till 10, 10, he said, or 10, 10 05, oh, okay. Um, I encourage you to go to one of these block explorers. So you actually did go to bitcoin.com uh, and you can see you can see the interfaces to the blocks. Um, the other thing is um, I want to uh, show you how they all work together. The digital signatures and the hash chains uh, working together. Uh, you'll see a chain of transactions in this site. And then if you tamper with one of the transactions, say you change the transfer $20 to transfer $200, you'll see that not only does that modify, that invalidates the signature for that transaction, it also invalidates the hash. And if the adversary patches up the hashes, you'll see that that signature remains invalid. And so miners are, are programmed to reject all blocks with invalid signatures on them. And so a miner would never want to mine a block with a known invalid signature because no other uh, node would accept that block. And so this is how you guarantee that the state of that ledger is, is, is authentic. Uh, so that's what I want to show you. So if you click on this, um, this link, you see that we have a blockchain that's um, been validated with both the signatures uh, and the hashes. Um, uh, say I want to change this from one, uh, $10 to 100 uh, It invalidates all the subsequent blocks uh, in this case. Oh, geez, thank you. What the hell happened? <laughs> oh, no. So you'll see uh, some transactions here. This is uh, block three. So there's five blocks. Uh, I want to change this transaction from $10 to 100. And you'll see that it invalidates all the subsequent blocks. Uh, and you'll see that the signature is invalid. And so even if I mine, so first of all, no miner would mine this because uh, it's got an invalid signature and it wouldn't be accepted by the, the nodes. But if you did mine this, you would have to chain, you'd have to mine the rest of the chain. So you can, it's really hard, it's really hard to change history is what I'm getting at. And so you would have to remine this. You could generate the, the hashes that patch up the hash chain parts of this, but you would always have this signature being invalid. You can't fool that. So these are two checks. Authenticity of every transaction is one check. And then the integrity of the chain is another check. And those are the two properties. So, so even though this is, this is uh, a properly mined block, it's got an invalid uh, transaction in it. And so you could, you could send that out, but then hopefully this would get rejected by all the miners. All the miners would, in unison, get rid of that block because it's got this invalid signature. And that's where I will uh, end today. Um, and I'll see you uh, next week or on the Slack channel.